All right, good morning. Today we are working through um, one standard that has two separate subsections, but the subsections really work well together. Um, so we're going to package them together. So the first subsection is uh, give examples of linear equations in one variable with one solution, infinitely many solutions, or no solutions. And then the second part of the standard is we'll be solving these linear equations with rational number coefficients, including equations whose solutions require expanding expressions using the distributive property and collecting like terms. So um, in a nutshell, that first part, the AEE7 subsection A, we're going to learn how to identify equations um, based on their solution set. So do they just have the one solution? Is there no solution? Or is it infinitely many solutions? And then the second part of this standard is really just focusing on the algebra we started in seventh grade. The only major difference here is we'll be using some rational number coefficients. So we'll see a lot more fractions than we did in seventh grade. But the distributive property and the collecting of like terms should all be very similar to what we did before. Okay, so here's the breakdown of what one solution, no solution, and infinitely many solution looks like. If we are working with an algebraic equation, and it is true, meaning there is an answer to it, it will either have one answer, which you've seen so much in seventh grade when we get down to the bottom and we just have x equals 3 or x equals 4 or in this particular example they have x equals 9. So this should this one here should be very similar to how it worked for us in seventh grade. Um, the other true algebraic expression would have infinitely many solutions which means I could put any number in for x and it would work. So as you can see the equation on the infinitely many solutions, um, it's set up the same on the left and the right side of the equal sign, which means it does not matter what number I put in for x, the same number is going to go in, it's going to do the same process on both sides, and I'll end up with the same answer on both sides. So when both sides are equal like that, that tells me that there are infinitely many solutions. And then the center is when that equation just doesn't work. It's just false. It doesn't work. doesn't matter what I do to it. It just will not work. So zero will never equal five, right? We know that zero is zero, five is five. Those two things will never be the same. So before we jump into how to actually solve these algebraically, I want to remind you of those inverse operations, those opposites. We did some work with them last year. Um, it wasn't your first time doing algebra. If you recall in classroom, I told you you've been doing algebra since kindergarten when you had to fill in the missing number. It's the same thing. Algebra is the beautiful uh, quest to find the unknown. And the unknown mathematically is a variable, and variables are letters, okay? So inverse operations you need to know. The opposite of addition is subtraction, and the opposite of subtraction is addition. Multiple Multiplication and division are inverses of each other, and then squares and square roots are also inverse of each other, which we've talked a little bit about squares and square roots, but not too much. So don't worry about that one. I really want you to focus on those top four, because those are the ones we're going to need the most to be successful. All right, so I have some problems here that I want us to practice. All right, so I have for us some problems to practice. Um, so on number one, we have 2x plus 2x plus 2 equals 4x plus 2. So in a problem like this, I need to combine my like terms. What do I mean by like terms? Well, like terms have to have the same variable with the same power. So... I'm looking, I have a variable x on the left side of my equal sign. I also have another one on the left side of my equal sign. So notice I'm only trying to combine like terms on one side of my equal sign separate from the other side. So 2x plus 2x means I can combine 
those terms into 4x. So I'm only adding the coefficient or the number in front of the x, and then my variable stays the same. Then I'm just going to rewrite the rest of my equation. What do I have here? I have 4x plus 2. I can stop right here because I already know something very special about this. If I refer back to my last side, I can see I have a setup very similar to this one where it is the same on both sides. So when it is the same on both sides, we call it infinitely many solutions, meaning I can put whatever number in I want for x, and it will always equal the same thing on both sides of that equation. Let's try another one. Down here, when I have this number outside of my parentheses, this is 3 multiplied by the quantity x minus 1. I know that I need to utilize my distributive property. So I'm distributing this 3 to everything in those parentheses. So 3 times x gives me 3x. 3 times negative 1 gives me negative 3 equals 2x plus 9. So nothing on that side has changed. Now I need to combine my like terms across my equal sign. So I need to move this 2x so it's over here with this 3x. Now it's currently a positive 2x. So what do I need to do to 2x to turn it into 0x? Well, I'm going to subtract 2x and subtract 2x from this side. That leaves me with just 1x over here. You can write the 1. You don't have to. It's up to you. I did nothing with that, so I'll leave that alone. Equals 2x minus 2x. That becomes 0, so it cancels out, and I'll leave my 9. So x minus 3 equals 9. Some number minus 3 equals 9. How do I figure out some number? Well, if I refer back to my chart, I know the opposite of subtraction is addition. So I'm going to add this 3 and add this 3 to both sides. I'm running out of room here. But x, negative 3 plus a positive 3, that's going to cancel out. So x equals 12. x equals 12. And I know, based on that result, because it looks like this one, there's only one solution. So the only time when this equation equals the same thing on both sides, it's when I substitute the value of 12 in for x. Now I can go back and check my work. I absolutely should get in the habit of going back to check my work. So let's do that. Erase this stuff. Give us some room. And let's do some checking. So if I have 3, wherever I have x here, I'm going to replace it with a 12. And I put that 12 in parentheses so it looks a little cleaner. Because if I had just written 12, I would probably think it was 212. So the first thing I need to do on this side is work with these parentheses. So 12 minus 1. I know that to be 11. When I have a number next to a number like this, it indicates multiplication. So 2 times 12 is 24. 24 plus 9. So let's solve this. 24 plus 9 is 33. Again, I have an indication of multiplication. So 3 times 11 is 33. Those two things equal, my solution checks out. Okay, so on your work, when I ask you to check your work, not only do I want to see the first piece we walk through together, 
I also want to see this piece. It is so important to get in the habit of checking your work. And the more you practice checking, um, the easier it can get for you. Because you may be able to skip some steps. You might figure out, oh, I can figure that in my head. But especially on these standardized tests, which are like designed just to confuse you. In a lot of ways, it is so important to get comfortable checking your work. All right, let's see. Let's do one with fractions. All right, that doesn't want to erase. That's fine. So let's jump down to number eight. I have four times the quantity x minus one equals one half times the quantity x minus eight. So now I'm working with the distributive property on both sides of this equation. So let's work that out. I know I need to multiply that four through. So four times x becomes four x. Four times negative one becomes negative four. Bring down my equal sign. I'm distributing again. Negative, or excuse me, one half times x. It's just one half x. One half times a negative eight. I can write this several different ways. So allow me to show you. One half times negative eight. So whenever you have a whole number, make sure you turn it into a fraction. And then we multiply across. So multiply my numerators together. One times negative eight, I get negative eight. And then two times one just leaves me two. I can leave it like this if I want, or I can remember that every fraction is a division problem. So negative eight halves is the same thing as negative eight divided by two, which I know to be a negative four. So I can rewrite that just like that. Now I need to do some shuffling around. I need my variables on one side of this equation my constants or my numbers on the other side of the equal sign. So I'm going to move this one half. And I'm going to move it over here. So this piece cancels. Four minus one half leaves me with three and a half X minus four equals minus four. The opposite of subtraction, again, is addition. So that cancels. And what do I have here? I have three and a half X equals zero. Hmm. Well, the only time that that could be true is when x equals zero. So once again, we have a one solution problem. So in this example, we've done, we've seen infinitely many. We've seen a couple with one solution. Um, we will continue to practice so you get exposure to what a no solution looks like. But the key takeaways of this, when we're working with these algebraic equations, equations, we're going to have three varieties. They will all fall into these three different hats. They will either have one solution, infinitely many solutions, or no solutions. And we determine that by using our algebra. So if you are rusty on your algebra, it's time to get in your practice because it's showtime. So Take this knowledge, go forth and be great. Ciao for now.